So in our previous example about the periodic square wave, periodic square wave, what I was telling you is that if you if you actually increase, if you fix the width of the uh, non-zero part, right? So fix n1 to uh, 2, right? But if you actually increase the length of one period, the fundamental period, we try the different values, right? 9, 11, 21, 41, that kind of thing, right? If you increase the length of the period, which basically pulls apart these two, together, uh, so, so increasing the distance between this non-zero block, this non-zero block, and uh, this non-zero block. What you actually recover in the Fourier domain, if you do the Fourier series calculations, is that you are actually increasing the samples, the number of samples, increasing the number of samples of this envelope function. Right? So, increasing the fundamental period of big N in the time domain is equivalent to making a denser sample of this particular envelope function, and uh, to the extreme case, to the extreme case, if you actually increase big N, the, the fundamental period, to like infinity, to infinity, then in time domain you basically recover a a periodic a periodic function, right? Because your period is like infinite, right? It's essentially a uh, a periodic function, right? With just a one square wave, with just a one square, these two square waves are like uh, located at infinity, minus infinity and positive infinity. So it's essentially a a periodic function, right? In that extreme case, you basically recover a continuous sample of this envelope function in the Fourier domain, right? That's the Fourier series coefficient, right? So so let's try to formalize this idea, right? What I was showing you guys is that the discrete Fourier series, the discrete Fourier series, is a representation of periodic functions, right? But as we can see for now, if we actually increase the period of this periodic sequence to like an infinity, then all you have to do is to actually make this frequency domain sampling a continuous function, right? So it gives us a opportunity to actually define the Fourier series coefficients, or the what do we call the Fourier transform, a discrete time Fourier transform for an a periodic sequence, right? So, so let's try to formalize this idea, right? Let's try to formalize this idea. Now, suppose we have a a periodic a periodic sequence that looks like looks something like that, right? But it has finite duration. It's not it's sort of non-zero, only on a compact support from minus n1 to positive n1, for example, for instance, right? And then outside of this finite interval, its amplitude is all zero, right? It's all zero outside of this finite interval, right? So it's essentially a aperiodic sequence, right? It's essentially an aperiodic sequence. But from this aperiodic sequence, we can construct a periodic sequence. We call it x wiggle n. We call it x wiggle n. This x wiggle n is basically just a, a repetition of the non-zero part of x n. You can sort of see that, right? So, so the non-zero part for x n goes from minus n one to positive n one. So here it's minus n one to positive n one. And outside of this interval, it's basically just a repeating itself. So we have effectively constructed a, a periodic sequence from a a periodic sequence, right? And this periodic sequence has Fourier series coefficients, right? And we can represent it as this, right? So x wiggle n, this periodic sequence, can be represented as a k e to the j k 2 pi divided by n times n, right? And k e is a sort of an arbitrary length. Uh, it's a it's a it's a con consecutive sample of this many numbers, big N. That's sort of the fundamental period, right? The fundamental period. So basically when we constructed this periodic sequence from this A periodic sequence, we're actually taking out big N number of samples. We're okay, taking out a big N this number of samples, right? So K goes from, uh, is, a, is, a, is equal to this thing, right? So X wiggle N is a um, periodic sequence constructed from a, a 
by repeating a aperiodic sequence. And then we have our for our four series coefficients a k can be computed using the four uh, the, 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 the 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 equation that we have talked about. Right. This equation is actually exactly the same as our uh, analysis equation. Right. Our analysis equation. That's this equation. Right. So this is the synthesis equation. This is the an analysis equation. Right. So, 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 so for our for our periodic sequence x we go in, this is our synthesis equation. Right. Exactly the same actually. It's exactly the same as our um, as this synthesis equation. Right. Except that we change the capital A to the small case A. Right. And this um, this is the analysis equation. Still the same, exactly the same as before, except the, the notation changed a little bit, right? And uh, and uh, and uh, this summation range, the summation range is an is is over one fundamental period, right? For this analysis equation. At this stage, we can actually take advantage of the relation between x and x wiggle, right? Because this summation is over just one fundamental period, so we can pick any <coughs> any fundamental period. We pick the the fundamental period that goes from probably here to here, right? That includes just the one one period. And because x we go in within this one period, it's non-zero from minus big n one to positive big n one, so we can change the range of the summation. So n can go from like minus big n1 to positive big n1. And within this range, within this range, we can replace x wiggle in the periodic function. This thing, the periodic function, the periodic signal, with this aperiodic signal. Just within this particular interval, right? Within this particular interval. And because xn Xn is an aperiodic sequence that has finite duration, right? So, so this summation, this summation, that's n goes from minus n1 to positive n1, minus n1 to positive n1. We can extend the range. We can extend the range of the summation for Xn, right? Because we know that Xn is non-zero only in this finite interval, and it's zero outside of it. So if we actually extend the summation range from minus big N1 to positive big N1 to minus infinity to positive infinity, the, the contributions outside of this finite duration is zero, right? So we can effectively extend the range. See? Right. Because the Xn equals to zero outside of this finite duration. So so, so every number that's outside of this finite duration contributes nothing. So basically, we can actually replace this this particular summation with this particular summation for x n. Right. So now, if we actually define if we actually define a function, big x, big omega, big x, big omega, right? And this function is defined as what? As this, as this part, as this part. Here we have introduced the, the notation big omega. And big omega equals to what? Big omega equals to k times two pi divided by big n. Right. It's just basically this part. K times two pi divided by big n. Right. You can think of it as a uniform sample of the frequency axis with the interval, with a sampling interval that's given by two pi divided by big n. Right. You can think of it like that because k is an integer. Then you can represent the Fourier series coefficient a k as one divided by big N times big X with the independent variable big omega equals to k times omega zero. And omega zero is what? Omega is zero is exactly our sampling interval in the frequency domain. It's two pi divided by big N. Right. But for this big X omega, this particular function, it is actually a continuous function of big omega, right? It's a con continuous function of big omega. If we fix big omega 
to this final sample, final set of samples of the continuous axis, continuous frequency axis, then we can write x big omega as x k omega zero, right? Because k is the integer and omega is the sort of sampling interval. Then we have this representation for a k. Once we have this representation for a k, we can bring it back into the synthesis equation, right? We can bring it back into the synthesis equation now. So x we go in now equals to what? This summation k equals to k actually ranges from like a, within just the one fundamental period of big N, right? And then you can just replace a k with this representation. It's one over big N times big x k omega zero, and e to the j k. So so omega zero equals to two pi divided by big N, right? So two pi divided by big N, we can replace it with omega zero and N, right? So because one over big N equals to what? One over big N equals to omega zero divided by two pi two, two pi. So we can replace this one over big N with omega zero divided by two pi, right? And that's still the summation over k for one fundamental period. Nothing is changed here from here, to here right? So now, now let's imagine let's imagine what's going to happen. What's going to happen as big N goes to infinity? See, so so what what's going to happen when big N actually goes to infinity? When big N goes to infinity, this periodic sequence becomes this aperiodic sequence, right? Because big N becomes infinity, so this block and this block is located at infinity. So this block is basically at minus infinity, and this block is at positive infinity. So effectively, x wiggle N becomes the same as x N, right? When when big N actually becomes infinity. Right, so x we go in becomes x in. Right. So basically, we can we can replace we can replace x we go in with x in. Right. And then this summation becomes an integral. Right. But why? Why it becomes an integral? Right. Because omega zero is equal to two pi divided by big n. Right. So it means that when big N actually goes to infinity, omega zero, this sample interval in the frequency domain, actually becomes zero. So 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 if the summation interval actually becomes sample the sampling interval for this summation actually becomes zero, then this summation effectively becomes an integral. Right? So x wiggle n becomes x n. This summation becomes an integral, and then one over two pi is the constant. You don't really have to change it, right? K ranges over this uh, fundamental period, right? Which effectively actually becomes a uh, becomes a becomes a becomes a, this two pi, this one 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 period, right? And then k times omega zero becomes a continuous sample of big omega. E to the j k omega zero becomes e to the j omega zero, or omega j omega, n, and then omega zero can be replaced with d omega. So now we have recovered something that's actually the synthesis equation for an aperiodic sequence, right? So if we actually summarize, if we summarize the derivation that we have gone through here. We have defined a big X omega, this particular equation. So this effectively becomes our analysis equation for an aperiodic sequence. And as big N goes to infinity, we have recovered this equation, this integral, which is becoming our synthesis equation for an aperiodic sequence. So this is called a discrete Fourier transform here, right? This is a, the forward transform, and then this is the inverse transform. This equation, this analysis equation, 
was actually identical to the equation that we looked at at the beginning of this particular lesson. If you still remember what we talked about, right? So all we have done is to replace omega with big omega and we changed the notation. So the independent variable, we changed it to like a big omega. And then the rest of the equation is still the same, right? So n goes from like minus infinity to positive infinity, xn e to the minus j big omega n. That's our synthesis equation. Uh, that's our analysis equation now. Right? That's our analysis equation now. It's exactly the same as before that we talked about. Right? And then this is our synthesis equation. Right? We have de derived this synthesis equation by using the discrete for a series representation for periodic sequence for periodic sequences by going through this particular route right by increasing big n the fundamental period to infinity right. so 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 now we can sort of see what's actually the relation between discrete for the transform and the, the discrete for a series right you can sort of see the relation discrete for a series is for is for periodic sequence, right? But when we actually increase the fundamental period to infinity for a discrete <coughs> for, for a periodic sequence, we effectively recovered the discrete time for the transform. The discrete for the transform, right? And for the discrete for the transform, the summation effectively becomes a integral, right? And this. This analysis equation gives you a continuous function of omega, big omega. So, so, so now let's re-examine the square wave example, right? But now let's assume that the fundamental period is infinity. So it's essentially an aperiodic square wave now, right? So now let's use this particular formula. Let's use this particular formula, big X omega, big X omega, right? So here n goes from minus infinity to positive infinity, but we don't have to because it's non-zero only on minus n1 to n1. So we change the range of the summation. And within this range, xn actually equals to 1. xn equals to 1. So it becomes e to the minus j omega n. And then we can use geometric series just following the same kind of derivation that we did uh, in our uh, previous example, this, uh, this uh, periodic square wave derivation, right? We can sort of uh, follow a similar derivation by using geometric series, right? By using geometric series, and then we end up with we end up with this analytic expression for big X omega, right? It's a continuous function of big omega. Right? So, so, so now let's uh, let's let's uh, let's look at this particular function in in, in MATLAB, right? So, so the first thing I'm going to do is to construct a horizontal axis called omega. Let's go from like a minus 4 pi to 4 pi with a 0 0.01 sampling interval. Right? We can make it even smaller, but it doesn't make a big difference. So that's going to be our horizontal axis. right? And then pick x equals to 1. Pick x equals to sine, sine 2n1 plus 1. 2n1 plus 1 times omega divided by 2. Dot divide sine omega divided by 2. right? And then <laughs> So in this plot, in this plot, it's uh, this plot was computed by uh, using big N equals to 41. So it's still a periodic sequence, right? It's still a periodic sequence. So for this kind of periodic sequence with a with a quite large uh, fundamental period of 41, what you are actually recovering is a quite dense sample of this uh, envelope function of big X, right? That's uh, that's the same example. That's that's. Uh, that's what we computed in our last example. Right? But now let's plot on top of this particular figure of but plotting plotting big X. Right, let's hold on to the original figure and then plot omega. Let's use black. Right. And I think now you can sort of see it's um, it's actually a, this envelope function as a continuous function. Right? So this is just for one period. This is for one 
fundamental period that goes from like a minus pi to positive pi right from minus pi to positive pi but this function this function of big x omega is actually periodic it's actually it's actually periodic with respect to uh, omega right the reason it's periodic if you if you go back to to look at uh, one of the slides that we talked about we used before this particular slide right D, when we talked about discrete for a series what i was telling you is that xn the time domain signal has a fundamental period of big n right and then this frequency domain series coefficients also has a, a fundamental period of big n with respect to k see so so a0 actually equals to a big n and a1 actually equals to a big n plus 1 do you guys still remember this particular result? Right. So the Fourier series coefficient is actually periodic with a fundamental period of big N. The plots that we made last time and the, 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 the sticks that we are plotting on this figure is just for one fundamental period that goes from like a minus pi to positive pi. It's just a 2 pi, right? It's just 2 pi. But it's actually periodic. If we want to look at a larger interval. Suppose here we are actually plotting big X as a function of big omega, right? And omega goes from minus four pi to positive four pi, right? So so we can we can we can look at a larger interval. Right? So now it's actually goes goes from like minus minus four pi to positive four pi. So now you can sort of see big X is actually periodic, right? The interval that we're looking at before was just uh, this this center found, uh, this center segment, right? This segment, but it's actually repeating itself. It's actually repeating itself here, here, and then it goes on, goes on, right? It actually has a fundamental period of two pi, basically, a fundamental period of two pi, big X. So, so by making, by making, so if we want to sort of summarize, let's just uh, come back to this uh, discrete Fourier transform here, right? So now we have another analysis equation and another synthesis equation, right? We can compare this synthesis and analysis equation with the discrete Fourier series synthesis and analysis equation. And uh, we can sort of draw the kind of connection between them, between these two pairs, by just increasing big N, the fundamental period, right? If we increase big N, this fundamental period, to infinity, we basically go from DFS, or discrete for a series, to DFT, right? Discrete for a transform. And the route or the derivations that we have gone through is kind of summarized in this particular slide. So far, we have looked at the discrete Fourier series of periodic signals, right? And we have looked at the discrete Fourier transform of aperiodic signals, right? And we know that the DFT of an aperiodic signal, which looks like uh, this black curve here, right? And uh, the discrete for a series of aperiodic signal is related, right? It's actually related. So, if you have a aperiodic boxcar that looks like this kind of thing, right? Then you have you you have a DFT of it. And the DFT is going to look like the DFT of this aperiodic square wave is going to look like this uh, continuous black curve, right? And the DFS of the corresponding periodic signal, that's a periodic square wave train. This kind of thing, this kind of thing, is merely a discrete sample. It's just a discrete sample 
of the DFT of the aperiodic signal, right? Within just one period, basically, within just one fundamental uh, period, you can you can you can sort of see the magenta sticks here, right? The magenta sticks is sort of the the magenta sticks is sort of the discrete Fourier series of this periodic square wave. DFS of the periodic square, uh, periodic square wave, right? And uh, the black curve is basically the DFT of this aperiodic square wave, right? So, so, so what's going to be the DFT of periodic signals, right? We looked at uh, the the DFS of periodic signals. We looked at uh, the DFT of aperiodic signals, and then what's going to be the DFT of periodic signals? Right. So, so let's let's try to understand how we can actually uh, solve this problem. Right. DFT of periodic signals. Right. So for periodic signals, we have a DFS synthesis equation. That's that's that looks like that. Right. That, that's the DFS series. Basically, the, the synthesis equation for for for, for periodic uh, signal. Right. And uh, and it's basically the the, the the DFS that's a DFS coefficient, discrete for a series coefficient times e to the jk two pi divided big n times n, right? That's the synthesis equation for discrete for a series. That's this equation, right? That's exactly this equation, right? For periodic signals. So so if we have a periodic signal, then we have then we have a then we have this particular DFS representation, right? And a k, small k, can be any consecutive integers that's like a big N, this many uh, numbers, right? This many. So, so it can be, it can have any starting index. But if we choose starting to start from k equals zero, right? Then the summation range, the summation range can go from zero to big N subtract one, right? If we just fix Fix the summation range k to go from zero to big N subtract one, right. and we can write this particular summation into individual terms, right? A zero times e to the j k k k is zero, right? So so it's e to the zero's power. That's one. So it's a, so it's a k times one, a zero times one. So so it's a zero, right? And then for a one, k equals one. It's a, it's a one times e to the j k equals to 1 now, 2 pi divided by big N times N, right? And then A2, right? So on. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's each of the term. So basically, if we want to evaluate the discrete Fourier transform of this particular periodic signal, we have to re evaluate the discrete Fourier transform of each of those complex exponentials, right? Each of these terms, each of these complex exponentials. Because a0, a1, a2, a n subtract 1 are all just the uh, constants, just the numbers, right? But these are actually complex signals. These complex exponentials are complex signals. So we need to evaluate uh, the DFT of these uh, complex exponentials. So, 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 so suppose, suppose we write the complex exponential in this particular general form, in this general form, if the j big omega 0 n. Right, so big omega zero could be two pi divided by big n, two times two pi divided by big n, that kind of thing. Right, but but we assume it's just a big omega zero. Then what's going to be the Fourier transform, discrete Fourier transform DFT of this particular, this particular complex exponential? Right? And we can just apply the DFT analysis equation. That's the DFT analysis equation. Um, where's our DFT? Analysis equation. That's that's this equation, right? We can just apply this equation with the x n replaced by that complex exponential e to the j omega zero n with e to the j omega zero n, and we can evaluate that summation, and the result looks like that. Here, delta is the impulses, right? Impulse signals. So impulse signals, right? It's basically two pi ti times delta. Big omega subtract omega zero. Omega zero is the frequency of the complex exponential of the time domain, right? Frequency of the complex, and then subtract two pi l. L is 
an integer that goes from minus infinity to positive infinity. So if we want to draw a diagram of this this big x omega, then it's going to look like that. So at big omega zero, it's an impulse with an amplitude that's two pi. And then this impulse actually repeats itself with a two pi interval, right? That's because of this L, the summation over L, right? If L equals to zero, then it's a delta omega subtract omega zero, right? That's this particular stick, this impulse, this particular impulse. When L equals to positive one, then you get this in impulse. When L equals to minus one, then you get this impulse. And L goes from minus infinity to positive infinity. So what you are getting is lots of these kind of impulses with the interval with the separation interval that's two pi. So, so for for a particular complex scenario, looks like that kind of thing. The DFT of this thing is a periodic impulse train. Right? Lots of impulses separated by an interval of two pi. And uh, when L equal to zero, the location of for L the impulse, this particular impulse, this particular impulse. Right, the location of this particular impulse depends upon omega zero. Depends upon omega zero, and every other impulses are separated by a period of a fundamental period of two pi, and the horizontal axis is big omega. It's frequency basically, right? It's big, big frequency. Yeah. So, so if you have this result, if you have this result, you can bring it back to represent all these terms, right? The DFT of this term, the DFT of this term, this term, this term. This term, the DFT of this term is basically a0 times e to the j0 times 2 pi divided by big N times N, right? That's the first, that's the zeros term, right? Zeros term. So, so if you actually do that, if you actually do that, do that that's, um, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's the result from uh, that, that previous slide, right? So, what you actually can obtain is that a0, so 2 pi delta omega subtract, omega 0 is what? Omega 0 is 0 for the for the first term. So it's omega subtract 2 pi L, right? Omega 0 becomes 0. That's corresponding to a0. And then DFT for, for a1 times e to the j, 2 pi divided by big N times N becomes a1, summation over L, 2 pi delta, omega subtract, for this particular case, omega zero equals to two pi divided by big N. Omega zero is replaced with two pi divided by big N, two pi over big N, subtract two pi L, right? And then you can sort of apply the same kind of calculations to every term. What you end up with is is a, is a, is a summation of lots of these kind of impulse sequences, lots of these kind of impulse sequences, right? Basically, you have uh, this is the zeros term, right? And then this is the first term, and then this is big n subtract one's term, right? So in total, you have big n this many, this kind of impulse trends. You are basically superposing this many impulse trends, right? So graphically, it looks like something. It looks something like that, like this kind of thing. So, so the impulse train from the first term, for, from from this term, is gonna look like that, separated by two pi, right? Separated by two pi. But, but the zeros, zeros impulse is located at big omega equal to zero, right? And then you have for the second term, this term, this term, it's another impulse sequence, right? But the zeros term, when l equals to zero, when l equals to zero, the stick. The stick, the impulse is located at two pi over big n, two pi over big n. That's this stick, and then every other stick is sort of separated by a distant, a, a fundamental period of two pi, right? And then you have the third, the third impulse chain, the fourth impulse chain, and then the last impulse chain. So this is the last impulse chain. This is for big n subtract one, big n subtract one's term, right? And then the result is basically the result. So so so.
So the result is just going to be a superposition of all those impulse trains, right? All you have to do is to add this impulse train with this impulse train with every other impulse train. And you end up with this kind of signal, this kind of signal, right? So, so for, for if you just pay attention to the, the sticks that's sort of in the middle, right? All those sticks, all those impulses are just the superpositions of this stick, this stick, this stick, and all the impulses. That's kind of a, that's sort of the zeros order, the zeros term the zeros term of all the impulse trains, right? It's a summation of the zeros term of all the impulse trains, right? And all those sticks are just the summation of all the all the impulse, the, 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 first, the first stick of all the impulse trains. You add those together, you get this block, right? And then you, if you add those together, these, these sticks corresponding to AO equals to minus one, minus one, right? AO equals to minus one. Right. If you add those together, you get this block, right? And this block, this block, and this block are sort of identical to each other. They are repeating, right? It's basically the same pattern that's sort of repeating. And with a fundamental period, that's 2 pi, right? They're separated by 2 pi, right? So, so, so writing, writing, writing this for a discrete Fourier transform in, in this particular way, right, as a superposition of many impulse trains, right, but you can also write it in an alternative form, that's sort of the, a superposition or, or a repetition of this block, for example, right. So alternatively, you can also write a superposition of all those delta impulse trains as this, it's basically 2 pi times a k, 2 pi times a k, delta big omega subtract 2 pi k divided by big n. So what this, what this representation actually means is that you collect the a zeros term, right? You collect a o equals zero, all the terms that's equivalent to a o equals zero, right? So it's a zero times 2 pi delta omega plus a one, 2 pi delta omega subtract 2 pi divided by big N, right, plus everything, A big N subtract 1, for L equals 0, that's 2 pi delta big omega subtract, big N subtract 1 times 2 pi over big N, right, you collect all those terms together, right, and then, and then you collect, you collect, you collect L equals to 1, collect all the terms corresponding to L equals to 1, and then you collect all the terms corresponding to L equals to minus one, and then you do the rest of the L, right? So you can write it in either form, but this is a simpler form. This is sort of a, um, this, this, this representation actually corresponding to repeating this pattern by, by, by interval two pi, by interval two pi, right? So, so that, that's um, that's that's what we what we can say about the the DFT of periodic signals, right? So now, if we look at one specific example, periodic impulse train, right? Suppose we looked at this kind of look at this kind of signal. So x n, it's periodic, right? It's periodic because it's a delta n subtract k times big n. And k goes from minus infinity to positive infinity. Integers, right? K are integers. So it's a it's a it's a periodic signal. It's a periodic impulse train with the interval that's separated by big N. So that's uh, in time domain. This this particular signal looks like that, right? Fundamental period is big N. It's lots of sticks, lots of impulses separated by big N. So what's going to be what's going to be the discrete Fourier transform of this particular impulse train, right? We can we can just use this particular equation now. We can just use this particular equation. To use this equation, we need a k, right? A k is the Fourier series coefficients, right? So it's a DFS, and the DFS for this particular 
for this particular uh, periodic signal can be evaluated quite easily, right? So AK, here we are just using the DFS analysis equation. 1 over big N times summation over N, right? Xn e to the minus JK 2 pi divided big N times N, right? So if we just choose the summation interval from 0 to big N subtract 1, then within this interval we have just the one impulse, right? We have just the one impulse, right? And so the summation becomes just the 1. So it's 1 times 1 divided by big N. So AK equals to 1 divided by big N. Right. And then we can, once we have AK, we can bring this AK back into this particular formula. Right. It's 1 divided by big N. Right. 1 divided by big N doesn't depend upon K. So we can take this whole term outside of the summation. It's 2 pi divided by big N. And then multiply with the summation. Then delta big omega subtract 2 pi k divided by n. Right. So x omega equals to 2 pi divided by big n summation over k. Delta big omega subtract 2 pi k divided by big n. Right. So this is the impulse trend in the time domain. And its DFT is another impulse trend. Right. Both are impulse trends. DFT has a imp is an impulse train with this amplitude. It's not it's not unity, right? It's not unity anymore. But but it, it has this kind of uh, amplitude, two pi divided by big n. This many this 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 is the amplitude, right? And then for the time domain, the interval between the impulses is big n, right? That's the fundamental period. But in the frequency domain, the interval, the fundamental period, is two pi divided by big n. They are related to each other by the inverse, right? So so if you look at the time domain signal, it looks like that. It's a stick, another stick separated by big N. If you look at the frequency domain signal, big X omega, each of the stick are separated by 2 pi divided by big N. And then they have an amplitude that's 2 pi divided by big N, right? So if the period in time, in time, if the if the period in time is longer, then the period in frequency is smaller. The interval is smaller, right? It's they're related to each other by the inverse. So, why do we want to study this kind of periodic impulse train, right? And the reason is that the periodic impulse train is related to the sampling theorem. So let's talk about the sampling theorem. So suppose we have a continuous function that's called xt here, right? xt, and we want to generate a discretized sample or digitized sample of this continuous function. Right? What we can do is to multiply this continuous function with a impulse train that's called a pt. We basically multiply this continuous function with this thing, pt. Right, and uh, suppose the interval or the fundamental period between this uh, between the two neighboring sticks is big T. That's basically our sampling interval in time, right? In time domain. And then we can write this impulse train as a superposition of delta T subtract an times big T. And n is the integer, and n goes from minus infinity to positive infinity, right? So x P T. That's our sampled, sampled signal, XPT, this dashed line here. Uh, no, no, the, 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 the discretized uh, sequence here, right? The dashed line here is sort of corresponding to the continuous signal, right? If we, if we, if we multiply this with the impulse train, this periodic impulse train with the fundamental period of big T, the sampling interval big T, then we can recover a sampled XPT, XPT. So, what we want to study is that, what we want to study is that, what's going to be the threshold t, what's going to be the threshold fundamental period of big T, so that the sampled signal can be used to recover the continuous signal uniquely. Right. The sampled signal is discretized, right? So you basically have no control about what's going to be what's going to be the shape of this function between 
two neighboring sticks, right? So, so, so the, the dashed line is our continuous function, right? But, but if you just have a set of samples at the location of the sticks, it doesn't. You don't really have any control about what's going to be the shape of the function between sticks, between the two neighboring sticks, right? The function could do something that's quite weird between between two neighboring sticks, right? But what the question is that what's going to be the interval big T? So that we can actually uniquely determine the continuous function from those sampled sticks, right? So that's our problem. That's our question. So what's going to be the big T? So how dense you want your sample to be in order to actually uniquely recover this continuous function from a finite set of samples, right? A discre finite discretized sam samples. So, so in the time domain, it's basically two functions multiplying each other, right? The continuous function xt multiply with pt. pt is our impulse chain, periodic impulse chain with the fundamental period of big T. So let's look at the Fourier transform of xpt, right? And when we talked about the properties of Fourier transforms, one of the properties is related to multiplication. So if you guys don't remember uh, that particular property, let's just uh, um, when we talked about the properties of the discretized for uh, discrete time Fourier transform, we had several properties, right? Folding, convolution, right? Correlation, and then multiplication, right? So in time domain, we basically have two signals multiplying each other. One is a continuous time original signal. The other one is a impulse train, a periodic impulse train. And the Fourier transform of two signals multiplying each other is equal to the Fourier transform of the first signal convolve with the Fourier transform of the second signal. All right. So so multiplication in time domain is equivalent to convolution in frequency domain, right? So we can use this result. We can use that result. We can use our, that result here, right? We can use our result that result here. So the Fourier transform of xpt should equal to here we have a this one over two pi, a factor of one over two pi. The reason is because of where this is a continuous time signal, right? Continuous signal. So big X omega is sort of the continuous Fourier transform of XT, right? And then P omega is the Fourier transform of this impulse chain. And what we have to do is to do a convolution between these two. We have to convolve big X omega with big P omega. So in the frequency domain, this kind of multiplication happens as a convolution, right? Suppose big X omega, here, big X omega, that's the f spectrum, the Fourier transform of this continuous time signal, xt. Suppose it looks like that, right? It doesn't have to look like that, but suppose it looks like that. F actually, for most of the signals, that, that we can record in nature, most of the time it's actually band limited. Most of the signals occurring in nature are band limited, which means what? Which means that you have a maximum frequency, omega big M, and above this maximum frequency, the amplitude becomes either exactly zero or very close to zero. So most of the signals that occurs in nature are band limited, which has a maximum frequency omega. We can denote it as omega big M. And then what's going to be the Fourier transform of PT, right? What's going to be big P omega? So here we have looked at the the Fourier transform of an impulse train, and we know that the Fourier transform of an impulse train is another impulse train. But the interval are related by the inverse, you see. 
2 pi divided by inverse. So in time domain, if the interval is big n, then in frequency domain, the impulse is uh, separated by 2 pi divided by big n. So here, in time domain, the impulse is uh, separated by big T. See? So in frequency domain, it's still going to be six impulses, right? But the impulses are going to be separated by, let's call it omega s. And omega s is going to be 2 pi divided by big T. Again, inverse. It's basically 2 pi divided by the inverse, uh, divided by the, the, the interval in time, in time domain. That's big T. So, so big P omega, big P omega basically looks like that. It's a, another sequence of impulse train with the in interval between the neighboring impulses to be 2 pi divided by big T. And big T is actually the sample interval in time domain for this particular time domain impulse train. Right. And then what we have to do is to do a convolution between these two. We have to convolve this with this this impulse train. So what's going to happen is that if you if you have just one impulse, suppose you have one impulse lo located here, and if you convolve this with this particular single impulse, then what's going to happen is that you're basically shifting this spectrum to this particular location. What you're getting is this particular triangle. Right? That's convolving with just the one impulse. But now we have lots of impulses, right? But these lots of impulses are just the superpositions of individual impulses, right? And we know that convolution is linear. So what's going to happen is that you're basically just shifting this spectrum to here, to here, to here, to here, to here. Basically just repeating this particular spectrum many, many times. So what you're actually getting by convolving this with this impulse train is a train of basically this pattern. Just this pattern that sort of keeps repeating itself at all those locations where you have a impulse. Right. You can sort of see that. Right. So now we have to be careful now. We have to be careful now. Because the interval between those impulses is omega s, and the width, and the width of this particular spectrum is two times omega big M. Right, it's from minus omega M to positive omega M. So the width is two times omega M. Right. So so if omega s is wider than two times omega M, then you get this kind of thing, this kind of repeating patterns. But if omega s is smaller than 2 times omega m, then the two neighboring triangles are going to interfere with each other. You end up with this kind of thing. right? The triangles are no longer separated. They start to interfere with each other. What you're actually obtaining is no longer individual triangles. It's sort of this triangle, and, and you, you have to superpose those two tri neighboring triangles, and what you are actually getting is something that's 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 not that's not not exactly zero between 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 those two neighboring triangles. And this kind of situation is not what you wanted. You don't really want this kind of situation because once this kind of situation actually happens. There's no way that you can actually recover any of those triangles, right? If the situation is like this kind of thing, you can just obtain the original triangle by just windowing, right? You can just window out every other triangle and just retrieve the triangle that's sort of in the middle. That's going to give you the spectrum of the original continuous function, continuous time function. And in that case, all you have to do is to do a inverse Fourier transform. You can obtain, you can obtain this continuous time function in time domain, right? But once this kind of interference actually happens, there's no way for you to actually separate just one triangle, right? 
it's impossible for you to actually retrieve one individual triangle that's intact, that's not interfered by any other neighboring triangles. Right. So what's going to be the condition? What's going to be the condition for you to to prevent this kind of situation from happening? And the, the, the condition is actually quite simple. All we need is omega s is larger than two times omega big M. And we know omega s is 2 pi divided by big T, right? And omega m is sort of the angular frequency. So if you want to use hertz, that's the inverse of seconds, then you have to divide by 2 pi, right? So, so it's 2 times 2 pi fm. And fm is, is, is not in, in terms of radian, it's in terms of hertz, right? So you can rearrange the terms. What you obtain is big T has to be smaller than 1 over 2 times fm. Fm is in hertz, right? So, 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 so your sampling interval, your sampling interval in time domain big T, now is actually related to the inverse of the maximum frequency of the original time continuous time signal. And omega s is now called a Nyquist frequency. It's called a Nyquist frequency, right? The Nyquist frequency is 2 pi divided by big T. Big T is the sampling interval in time, right? So, so once you actually have a sampling interval, big T, you can compute the Nyquist frequency in this particular way, 2 pi divided by big T. And then all you have to do is to compare this omega s with the maximum frequency of the continuous time signal, right? And to make, and if you if you if you want to make sure that your your sample signal can uniquely determine the continuous time signal, all you have to do is to make sure that your Nyquist frequency is larger than two times omega m. You see which means that the sampling interval must be smaller than 1 over 2 times the maximum frequency of the continuous time signal in hertz. Right. Basically, this, this kind of, this kind of a, a derivation gives us, gave us a guideline, a guideline, a general guideline for us to choose the sampling interval. Right. If we want, if we want signals, if we if we if we fix our sampling interval to big T, then the maximum frequency that we can accurately recover is just the omega s. There's no way that we can recover signals that's with frequencies that's larger than omega s. It's impossible, right? Omega s, the Nyquist frequency, is basically the maximum frequency that can be accurately sampled using a sampling interval of big T. Every frequency above omega s cannot be accurately recovered. Right? So if we want to recover higher and higher frequencies, we have to reduce big T. Right? We have to reduce the sampling interval. And that's basically what the sampling theorem is actually telling us. We have to be careful about how we actually sample our continuous time signal because we don't want this kind of situation to happen. Right? We don't want the neighboring triangles to interfere with each other. <laughs>